I'm very excited to give this talk. I'm very happy to be here. And I have been for a few months now because uh, I, I got to meet uh, Andranik and then uh, to some of the team and see the care and attention that they paid into creating a great agenda and to for the preparation. So I, I think this is really uh, rather cool. So about myself, you heard I'm Mariano. I work with um, banks and insurance companies in uh, Germany in terms of AML. And today this mostly means then uh, LLMs or large models. And we talk, of course, about their strengths and their power. But um, given their size, there's also a lot to be learned about how to best deal with them in an efficient manner. And knowledge installation is a great tool. And it's one tool that at least you should know and everybody should have in their tool belt. And um, today, we have a little bit of time to go into details. And it should be very practical. And there should be three things for you to take home. One that is very simple, so simple that even if you didn't know it before, you should be able to explain this to everybody else afterwards. Second, still it is powerful. And you should be able to retain the performance um, that you want, but that you can adjust a lot of other parameters like um, latency and cost and, and so forth. And third, it gives you a lot of versatility. There are many more options that you can have for solutioning when you use knowledge distillation than you have a teacher and a student that are separate from each other. So I tell this to you as an end-to-end -end story and with the occasional blue screen in between. But let me introduce the hero of the story. And of course, you hopefully see this is a bird head on top of a transformer body. And in terms of large language models, it's probably that, not that large, at least not anymore. But because it's the OG, it gets the honor that uh, it's leading us to this story. And hopefully, we, yeah, we see what something again. We actually talk about making a model smaller, of course. And the initial thing then would be to say, this means we would reduce the size. We have a smaller version of the model that has fewer parameters than the original model. But it would be a very narrow view, and we would leave a few things uh, by the wayside that we could use to create a better application. And so the idea is that we will look at what is contributing to the performance in terms of training, uh, but also, of course, what are the features of an architecture that you can now uh, choose again when you have a, a teacher-student uh, situation. And we will see what are the different parts, and then we look uh, away from the implementation towards the task and which of those parts we want to double down on and which of the parts we can just leave behind so that we can have a smaller model that is easier to train. Now, these are the two main themes of the uh, presentation, so making it smaller and the mix and match op option. But to make it all uh, practical, we will also talk about how do we put this together so that you have a small pipeline that uh, creates this model. And then, of course, it's also relevant. Is it worth the trouble? What are the results? Um, what kind of improvement could I expect? Now, starting out, um, there's a few terms that we will uh, discover together. And uh, in case uh, one of us gets lost, either you or hopefully not me, um, this is a good opportunity when we go from the light theme that everybody loves to a dark theme uh, to reconnect. And everybody also loves, of course, transformers and stable diffusion. So we will always have a transformer that points away what is the next topic. And this is a great idea then to ask questions. You can ask at any time, of course. Um, but also, if we have the one or two discussions, this is then the point where we would regroup um, and to try to get back to the um, main story. So we were talking about size. And really, we want the small size, of course. And the question is, uh, it's kind of obvious but why we want the small size. Yeah, because for one, of course, it means these are faster models. And they are then also, because they're smaller, they're cheaper. But cheaper has some meaning in terms of business case. So for, for example, if you think about uh, you want to classify the sentiment of an email, if you have a model that is in the parameters of what your business case does, that's great. But if you have a model that is 100 times smaller and 100 times cheaper, then instead of just classifying one email, you just could go back further and to see what was the history with the customer, what did we learn over time, which is a stronger signal that you can get because you apply uh, the appropriate amount of compute to the problem at hand. The point that's the most important to me about knowledge distillation is that with the smaller models, it's very, very easy to train a lot of them to do a tuning for the hyperparameters. So you can formulate your intuition, what you think that should be happening, and then you can try it out. And then you get some real feedback empirically, which you can use to then adjust your approach. 
And this is much better than with a very large model that you have some idea and then you pray that it works because you know that it will take a while until it's done and you also don't want to spend the money again. But with the smaller model, you can use it as a tool to learn for yourself and to create good results. Now we will start with a quick review of uh, model capacity and their impact. There should be nothing new to you. You have seen this before. Since 2018 to 2022, we had bigger and bigger models. And right now, we've heard this from Lubna uh, this morning uh, again about the chinchilla rules, uh, about the scaling laws. And um, um, th th there's also the idea that instead of making models bigger, that we try to work with better data. But at the end of the day, um, this probably will return, uh, that we will get better, better models. Uh, sorry, bigger models, better models as well. But bigger models... Um, because there's no saturation, saturation so far um, in terms of parameters and, and not in terms of tokens that we have uh, seen. There's a lot of uh, fireworks going on here. <laughs> Blue screens, lights, awesome. Um, and of course, then there will be multimodality, right? So there will be more, there will be bigger models. This makes a lot of sense um, in, in many ways. Of course, the idea is why is it good to have bigger models? We want to have better performance and uh, ChatGPT uh, certainly uh, changed the world perception about what AI can do and how it can fool us or how it can impress us uh, with eloquence and uh, a lot of knowledge. But I want to go back to 2018 to the BERT year and um, that was the first time that we had this GLUE benchmarks, the general language understanding uh, evaluation and the G part, the general, Meaning at this point, there was the idea that NLP is not something for a very few select tasks, but that you can broadly use NLP for many, many tasks uh, in, in uh, a universal, almost universal circumstances. And so this task had like nine subtasks, uh, sentiment classification and uh, um, 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 gra the, the right grammar and understanding of text and so forth. And it was designed in a way that there was some headroom uh, from the current SOTA to the benchmark results so that we can see how to grow. And then BERT came and then all this headroom was gone. And so the next year we went from glue to super glue. And then there was Big Bench and um, the, we have the leaderboard now and helmet, et cetera. And so this is, so the, the life of a benchmark in NLP is apparently very short and exciting, but then there's something new except some of the use cases are still relevant today. So if you want to classify uh, sentiment or to understand uh, who's going to work on this email, for example, right, then you still have the same uh, requirements that you had before and a larger model is not gonna help you. It's maybe helping you that much, but you have to pay that much to get that. And so this is a recurring theme, hopefully today in this uh, talk to uh, reflect on what you want to use it on and then to use the tools that are, uh, give you the most bang for the buck. The specific thing that we will have as end-to-end -end story is just going from bird base to a much smaller model, um, but the mechanics that I'm showing, they will be applicable to any kind of size um, of model. So knowledge distillation is a really super simple concept. We have a teacher that is more powerful than the student, which gives it the ability to help the student to learn either faster or better or to a higher level of performance or all of the above. And it's doing that in a very neutral fashion based on its own um, um, extra potency of, of uh, features uh, like that it is bigger or that it's maybe an ensemble of model or that it has access to more data, even maybe multimodal data, even though the, the uh, student could be uh, unimodal. And you can do that because mostly we transfer the, the knowledge through labels. So it's completely independent of any kind of implementation or encoding of data, uh, et cetera. So we can use, um, we can go from a large um, neural network to a very small linear regression. That probably doesn't make much sense, but you could because there, there's no dependency on the implementation details. The same is true for training de techniques or what kind of data we are going to use. It's not magic, of course. Um, so the, the task and the labeling scheme, they, they need to be compatible. It uh, doesn't mean they have to be the same. If you can automatically transfer, let's say, from one to five stars to positive, neutral, or negative, that's possible as well. But, of course, they need to be compatible in some way. So as a quick recap, um, this is, uh, oh, yeah. this is uh, our, our teacher. 
and it's just doing a forward pass on the data x and it's producing the predictions and so that we compare them uh, we use uh, y so that uh, the difference of it is our prediction loss and we use uh, back propagation to train uh, the teacher right and the same thing would happen for the student uh, completely mirrored we use the same data the same x and the same y and we, we get to predictions and um, uh, prediction loss as well so everything else being equal which of those models should be the stronger model the teacher, because I said so, it was a stronger model in the beginning, and there's really no connection between the two, so there's also no learning happening at this point. But the simple thing to um, extend it to do learning is to say we have a second loss term that we take the teacher prediction from here and the student prediction from here, and we take this difference as well and we backpropagate on this as an additional loss term. So I hope it's easy to see that this should be helpful to the uh, student if the teacher is more potent and bigger or faster in learning, etc., to then share what the teacher learned with the student. The other point that's uh, important to see is there's nothing in here from the implementation details that will be leaking over here. The only transfer we have been doing so far is from uh, these predictions to that predictions. That it's really just a copy of the labels, of the logics in this case. But of course, there's more to do the learning, and one of the things is the the uh, using dark knowledge. Who has, um, so there are a few things here. I, I understand that we have different backgrounds, and I will always ask when we have these black slides where you are roughly. So I will ask you, for example, dark knowledge, who would be able to explain this to the group if I would be calling on you when you uh, raise your hand. But I will not uh, call you when you raise your hand. I, I will promise that. I just want to know where we are if you do it really quickly or much longer. So would you be able to explain dark knowledge to the group? OK. So it starts with a forward pass. We have here our model. And we have this wonderful depiction of an apple uh, where I put an Olymp Olympic flame on top. And so we pass it as an image into the model and we have a few classes uh, to select from. So to know which one is the right one, uh, sorry, know the scores, to know which one is the right one, we use the ground truth. And so it appears easy to just say that the error between the prediction and the ground truth is our error. But if we want to maximize learning, can somebody tell me why this isn't such a good idea and what we're missing out on? Probably you are just giving in unequal weights to the wrong ones. Exactly. So if I were to ask somebody uh, if an apple and orange is the same, they would say no. If I then ask if an apple and zebra is the same, they would say no. But then they would say, but they're much closer, the orange and the apple, than the apple and the zebra. So it's not only that we're not learning enough, we're also learning the wrong thing here, right? Because we're saying orange and zebra is equally wrong, uh, which is not true. And when we use this dark knowledge, that is the knowledge that happens offside, off this uh, axis where we have the ground rules. All the other things that we have in the tail, this is signal as well. It will tell us how the teacher looks at the world. And this is something that we can transfer uh, using um, these labels. And these are hard labels, but if we were to go and use the, sorry, the teacher prediction with the soft labels, right, then we can also um, ha have an appropriate uh, error signal so that we can learn all of what the whole rich signal from the teacher. And we are not dependent on the teacher implementation, just on the, on the way that the worldview of the teacher is expressed in its outputs. These are then the soft labels. Is this making sense to you so far? Any questions so far? OK, there's more. Just after the blue slides, we will talk about. So question again, if I were to ask you to uh, tell us uh, to the group what softmax is, could you explain this to the group? OK, that's 39%, uh, I would say. OK, <laughs> now it's 45. Uh, and then could you explain temperature? OK, so 23.5%. OK, so back to the uh, prediction. And uh, we heard this uh, this morning already, right? We have a probabilistic model. We want to communicate uh, not just what's the winner, 
but we want to communicate our uncertainty as, as um, we, we learned this morning as well. And uh, so we can see that we have those four different classes, A to D, and clearly this is the winner. Clearly uh, they are basically uh, ranked. So it's A, B, C, D. By the way, you just have to forget about this blue thing, right? We, we, we pretend this is not happening. So A to D, um, this is the biggest one. We, we know that, but we also want, we know it's probabilistic, so we want to communicate to our user um, how confident are we in our prediction. And so the standard way to do this is to transfer this, uh, to convert this into a probability distribution where we have the sum of 100%, and the way to do this is softmax. So this together is 100%. So over here, we are calculating what is 100%. We are summing over all the different bars. Unfortunately, there are, some of them are negative, so we are summing over the uh, exponentiated uh, bars. But then we compare each of those to the sum of the bars. And so this gives us then basically the, the percentages as we see here, except for one thing. We can see that between A and B, there's um, roughly like three times uh, as much from a, a score perspective. Right, this one, but if you go over here, it's like six or seven times as much. So there's a, there's a huge boost in there, and that's also based on the uh, exponentiation of the function, which is quite helpful for us. And it basically um, uh, let it appear that we are more confident uh, um, about the uh, prediction than would be warranted by just looking at the scores. And this is what we can use for ourselves to better learn and to tune um, the, the learning we, we get from the, uh, from the logits. So this is uh, introducing temperature, and it, this is one, we, we divide each of the scores by the temperature parameter, and if it's just one, then we have the same thing that we had before, right? But if we raise the temperature, then this probability distribution starts to melt. You can see now that this was rather spiky, but now they come closer together, and if you look at the tail, in our case, the zebra and the orange, right, it came up. So it has a stronger meaning now than it had before. So we can influence how much we want of this dark knowledge. And the same thing is true in the other direction. We can um, reduce the temperature and then this will be freezing and we have this very spiky distribution, which means there's almost no tail anymore. So what would happen if you would go further to the right? If you go to positive infinity. What would happen to the probability distribution? <laughs> exactly. So it will be totally melted, so we have this uniform distribution over here, and on this side, we have the one hot again. Right? So it's the same thing as if we just had hard labels as we had originally. So we can decide pretty much where we want to stand. And now there's an interesting thing. Um, if you were to look at at an ordinary, let's say, public data set that has um, almost perfect quality, which setting do we want to have? Which temperature do we want to have? Is it above one or below one if we want to learn more during distillation? Question, question to you. Who thinks we should go into this direction and that direction? Okay, so most don't have an opinion, but uh, this side won, and of course that would be true for most uh, of the use cases, especially everything that I said so far would indicate this is right. But it's something to be tuned and to be seen depending on your specific data set. And so I have a data set, I will t tell you about it in a second, but going from zero to 100 shows us first this inverted S-curve, which is great, because uh, many parameters, when you tune something, you find out they don't mean much at all. Uh, so that's a good starting point. It means something. But now we will zoom in a little bit, just from 0 to 2. And uh, this is the performance, right? And we would have expected that the performance is the best at 2, by, by everything that I said so far. But we find out, oh, sorry, we find out that it's at 0.5. So we're actually freezing. Right? We, we, we reduce uh, the uncertainty in it and we, 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 are no, we are no more confident than would be warranted by just the numbers. So why is that? Anybody wants to take a guess why this happened? It's about the data set? 
So we will come back to this data set later. So let me quickly introduce this. It's like seven or 8,000 posts from Stack Overflow. And for each of those, we have seven labels. And maybe because of we reducing the, co uh, the confidence, the probabilities of uh, getting uh, right answers are getting higher. And that's why we are starting to give uh, more accurate answers, but the uh, confidence is going to uh, be reduced. It's kind of um, because of we are labeling and uh, the, because of the temperature that it's uh, smaller than one, uh, our mod model started to be not uh, confident and uh, it's kind of counter to uh, <coughs> confidence and high accuracy there. Not yeah, I think it goes in the right direction. It's actually that the, the, uh, the data um, it contains ambiguity, ambig uh, sorry, ambiguity. You know, we have the seven labels and you would say this post is about AML. Yes. Is it about compute? Yes. Is it about database and storage? Hmm. Some people may say yes, some people may say no, because it may be, pass may, may be mentioned in passing or not. So when we uh, used this with the people who did the labeling, they didn't agree completely. And we couldn't even with many iterations on the instructions, we couldn't get them to agree because there is ambiguity in the problem. So the, the, uh, so reducing the, 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 um, uh, the temperature was even helping us to regularize uh, then the labels. And this was quite helpful. I hope I didn't get you too much off track. So if you were to start with this too, that would be the right, right approach most of the time, I would say, right? But, um, when I, I talk to customers, the real data set that they create for themselves, not for a competition or something, uh, they very often have uh, something that they want to automate with real users and they have ambiguity. And so this is uh, still kind of relevant, I would say, from a practical perspective. Okay. I will continue. We have so far, it looked like uh, the teacher and the student were trained at the same time in parallel. And that's possible. It has a few uh, benefits to do it this way. But it doesn't have to be this way. And another approach is to do it offline, meaning in sequence. And so in this approach, we still have uh, the, the picture that we had before, but now we pull it apart and to have uh, separate steps. Specifically, we now train the teacher model and then we have a separate step to create our new labels using the teacher model. So we have our soft labels here. And then we train when this teacher is completely done, completely created new data, then we train the distilled model. So it's a three-step process now. And looking at it, sorry, we um, have one dependency that I would like to point out, and it's it's kind of a small thing, but it has a big impact. And this is, we have X and Y. And if you were to guess, what's your opinion? What is more expensive to create, X or Y, or to collect? Y. Y, of course, right? If you, if you think about a million emails, it's easy to select some. But to find labels, you have to have somebody who does the work, right? And so we are always uh, constrained, uh, at least if it's a manual process, uh, by why. But when we look at the inference uh, that we're doing here, where we create those soft labels, we don't have a dependency on y. We only have a dependency on x. That's super, super helpful because we can then create more of those emails. We can collect them as many as we like, and we would get new labels for it, new soft labels, using our potent teacher that was trained before. And as a very quick sidestep, uh, in uh, computer vision, we use a, a lot of image augmentation, right? And that's really hard to do in NLP. But if you have a, a distillation and you have a lot of unlabeled data, then you can use that approach to get to a similar, uh, to a similar effect that you help to learn the, the, the student model from this wider understanding of more variance in the uh, in distribution uh, data. But back to the picture, uh, we then train the student uh, with the original X and we have the Y to compare and then we have X2, Y uh, prime and Y2 prime from the um, uh, pseudo label step that we had in between. And typically, this could then, for example, say that you have like 5,000 uh, emails that where you have a label for and maybe 50,000 where you don't have anything for that. 
one thing to keep in mind when we go forward, uh, every number that I would show you um, is always based on X and Y. So if I show any F1 or so, it's never computed on our own labels, of course. I'm just saying this for uh, completeness. All right, so this was everything about the knowledge station for the moment, and we can get back to this. Ideally, I would tell you now if it's performing well, and I can tell you, yes, it's performing well, but I want to go into some detail to explain this uh, to you, what the performance looks like. And so for now, I'd like to uh, stick here with the, with the bird, bird hanger, but we'll get back to this uh, in a few minutes, okay? So now, next topic is the, when we do mix and match, is starting with the training. So when we talk about pre-training versus fine-tuning, um, who would be able to explain this to the group? To 30%, okay, let me think. All right, um, so let's take this a little bit slow. So this is a picture you will see a few times now in the presentation. Uh, this is then the, the transformer architecture in a little bit of a abstracted way. We see our uh, tokens, we see that we have the embeddings that we're gonna look up. We have transformer layers that will enrich and uh, do the information routing. And at some point we have the summary of uh, everything that was enriched that we then map to the classes of our, um, of our task. This makes sense to everybody, right? Okay. So for the pre-training versus fine-tuning, we have two different uh, parallel worlds. They're not connected at all, at least not yet. On the left side, we have this next token prediction uh, where we have the task that we say we have an, a random sentence of the internet and then we, we mask out the last word and then we try to predict the last word. And given that we know how sentences end uh, or how they are completed, there's a lot we can learn about the relationships. In particular, uh, the cool thing is that we create our own labels. So this is then self-supervised learning, which also allows us to have like millions, hundred millions or billions of examples that we want to uh, look at. And so we would learn very subtle things. While on the other hand, we have the sentiment prediction where we take an email or an, uh, a review and we would say, is it a positive, neutral or negative? But we may have just 5,000 of those documents because we have to create those labels ourselves. But if we were to train them, they're completely separate, we would see that in both cases, sorry, different tasks and different data, but they have the same architecture with, uh, with the transformer blocks and the embeddings. And if we start to train them, we'll see that there are some specific parts in this model that are very, very um, uh, specific to next token prediction, and on the other hand, uh, things that are at the, close to the top that are very specific for uh, sentiment prediction. But at the same time, as far as we go down, as close as we get to the sentences and the inputs, as close as it goes to uh, an understanding of language and about text, um, what, it, what it means, and this is not so different for the, for the two tasks. In both cases, we need to understand what is syntax, what is grammar, how do you negate a sentence, uh, what uh, words can you substitute to each other, etc., etc. So that is, um, they, they still learn this separate from each other, which also shows, if they are so similar, that ideally we would be able to learn from one another specifically to learn from the left side. So originally they're both completely uh, starting randomly in to totally empty models, right? And then we start training them. But the idea would then be to transfer the knowledge we have over here as a one-time activity from left to right. So that we would start here with a knowledge about language in general. Um, we would still have this, uh, this task head, which is absolutely specific to the task that is uh, randomly initialized, which is totally empty. We have to learn this. And also, it's not enough to just copy things over. We need to reconnect this. So we do this fine tuning. So where we also may have uh, specific words and sentences that, that we learned here that have a different meaning if it wants to do sentiment analysis. But we expect that these are small adjustments. So there's a problem with this approach. 
Okay, let me, let me talk about, yeah. Um, so but one thing that's great about this is that um, we may need at some point in time for sentiment analysis the understanding of irony or that we need to understand uh, some idioms. Like for example, if, if I were to say that the service was uh, great, I needed that like a hole in my head, then you know it's irony, right? You know nobody needs extra, hole in your in ex extra holes in your head. But if you just have like the 5,000 examples, you probably wouldn't have seen this. Maybe you just had this in your validation set. So you, you need it, but even if you had it like five times, that wouldn't be enough to learn from it. But over here with like 100 million uh, tokens or examples that we looked at, we may have like uh, 5,000 uh, of uh, examples with irony. So we could learn this. So we want to transfer this over, but there's a, there's a problem uh, with keeping this knowledge. Can you tell me about what the problem is if we transfer knowledge over once and then we update and update and update with this training data, the, the smaller student model, or the, sorry, not student, uh, the, um, um, uh, the fine-tuned model. Please, Alex. Get the pre-training data and overfit to the small fine-tuning data set. Exactly. So we could have catastrophic forgetting. We, we copy it over once and then every time uh, that we do an update, it may be that with our arm, we may knock over the information, that we override the information that we uh, that we learned over here because there's no signal in here that would pull it back if some, some other thing is more important. So there's a tightrope walk, there's a kind of a balance that we need to, sorry, uh, a, a kind of a balance that we need to uh, um, keep in mind so that we are able to retrain everything here or fine tune it, um, but we do not lose everything uh, interesting that is a little bit smaller from the fine tuning, from the pre training. And so the way to deal with this is oftentimes to say that we are cautious, that we stop the training uh, much earlier with fewer epochs, or that we say we have a, um, a small learning rate. And if you look back to uh, the coloring screen, we see it's, it's green at the, at, the, at the top where we have this very specific information for this task, but then over time it gets redder and redder. So we can say that we take a very large learning rate uh, on top, relatively speaking, and then we, we have smaller learning rates, maybe even to the point that some of it we don't train at all. We just freeze it because the knowledge of the meaning of the words is probably not changing that much. And if it were to change, we still have the chance uh, above here to, to slightly adjust uh, our understanding. All right. You can uh, ask me a question anytime. I hope this makes sense for you. I hope this is not too fast. This is not too slow. I'm happy for feedback. And then we talk about fine-tuning. You see there's a wonderful uh, bike. It's uh, coming from pre-training, so it basically does what it does, uh, does what you want, but not quite. So we, we see we need some work around the wheels and maybe we don't need the micro oven. Um, but nevertheless, um, it, it goes into the uh, right direction. So my point being um, that we uh, need to be careful what we select, uh, what we want to focus on. And so we come back to this uh, original picture but this time we simplify this a little bit and we say this is basically the, the, the part at the top is the classifier. Okay, then we have the transformer blocks and then we have the embeddings. That's uh, everything that's left now from the architecture. And we always need the, need the classifier, right? Because the classifier is the actual mapping to the, uh, to the task and it would be kind of hard to train without it. You can, but it's, uh, it would be really hard. So what would happen if we uh, only train the classifier and we, cook, we look at uh, different scenarios and we compare the number of parameters. So what's the cost? In this case, the cost is only 600K. This is this very, very small line over here. Hopefully you can see this. And the performance is 0.42, which is an F1 score, which is really not bad just with the classifier. But of course, we expect uh, that this gets better if we also tr um, unfreeze the, tr the transformer blocks and then we fine tune those. And we can see, yes, it goes up to 0.66, but we now have a cost of 86 million parameters that we have to fine tune. Now, the alternative approach would be to say, I just tune uh, the embeddings. And I see the cost is lower, 24 million, um, but also the performance is a little bit lower, but still, it, it's a marked improvement, right? And it's not that, not that bad. 
what does it look like if we do all of the above? And we see now we have the full cost of 110 million of a, of a bird base, but we have 0.66, which is the same number that we had above. Any ideas why that is, what it means? Okay, first question, yeah. Uh, fine tuning the embeddings doesn't help at all if, if, if we already have the training course, right? What was the second part? Like, if we already have the training uh, box uh, fine tuned, then uh, doing uh, like fine tuning embeddings yeah. doesn't help at all. Yeah, that's exactly right. So the the distinction I would make just in terms of precision, you said it completely right. If we don't uh, color this out and we freeze it, it doesn't mean that we don't use it. We still need uh, the pre-training. We still uh, believe in everything that we got as new features during the pre-training, like with the embeddings. The question is only, would we benefit from additional fine-tuning? And so the answer is, for the, uh, for the uh, words, uh, the meaning doesn't change that meaningful. So doing it, it's, it's not really all that helpful. And so you can do without it uh, if, if this is helpful for your task, especially because in the transform blocks, you could do something uh, to recover that if you had a, a few uh, loose ends over here. Does it make sense? OK. Now, I, I was talking in the beginning about that we have uh, this neutral approach that allows us um, to basically choose whatever we like uh, in our student architecture. And this is the place where we go. And we would start, of course, uh, we could use a completely different architecture. Um, this could be much bigger. I'm just picking four. Uh, but you can, of course, uh, you could also train and uh, uh, do this with a, um, uh, let's say, XG boost or something, right? at least uh, conceptually. Now, the question then is how to compare those. Um, of course, we're interested in performance, but first we probably want to have some intuition, and the intuition must come from our task at hand. What, what is it that we're doing? So if we, for example, want to classify uh, news articles, right? That we say this is sport news, this, this is business, that is uh, something else, then it may be uh, sufficient to use a logistic regression uh, with a bag of words because we really just care about which words do I see very often. Um, and I don't care that much about how do words interact with each other. We don't need to know about negation. You know, if somebody says there is a, a no goal or there is a goal, there is still both spots. It doesn't really matter all that much, right? So that could be a good starting point, And it has benefits, uh, especially it is totally independent of the length of the input. But you could also say that uh, the, the task that you have, let's say, for example, machine translation, that it would benefit from understanding that language is, uh, is a sequence and that you have recurring rules that you want to apply, that you would want to say uh, if a dog is on the second position uh, of a sentence or the seventh position, doesn't really matter. I want to apply those same rules because they mean roughly the same. And so then an LSTM could be great. And if you say you have machine translation, you have some relatively short uh, dependencies, so let's say you're... Um, Inside of you, you'd keep track of if you're inside of quotes or if the speaker is currently uh, female or male, for example, right? Uh, then this could be the exact uh, th uh, the exact thing that you're looking for, or you know that your task um, benefits very much from locality. That you have a, a sliding window from a CNN that you slide over your text, and uh, most of the words do directly interact within this, let's say, five uh, words uh, window. And then in all of these cases, you would be pretty OK uh, with larger uh, inputs, even with LSTMs if your uh, dependencies are small. Um, but of course, then you also could have a, uh, something where we want to have a lot of interactions between uh, the, the different words and the different tokens in the sentence. And then uh, the transformer uh, could be great. And from any point to any other point in the sentence, we can have dependencies. Uh, which is uh, nice, uh, as many of the transformer features are. But, but the point would still be that you look at your task and then decide what is the architecture and what are my non-functional requirements. And for example, length of input is one of the um, requirements that is pretty defining for whatever you're running afterwards. And it doesn't mean that you need to um, 
miss out on all the pre-training, right? You could still use a transform-based model as a teacher, but you would then say your student uh, is, a CS, uh, is, for example, a CNN or a logistic regression. Now, <clears throat> again, this uh, picture, and we, we start with the tokens. You can decide this again. You know that uh, the, the large model that you fine-tuned has a certain tokenizer and a certain encoding of the input, but for your task, it may be better to use something else. Let's say, again, you have this news article, then you would expect that there are some errors in it sometimes, but it's very, very infrequent. And if there are errors, they're not correlated, right? They're one of a kind each time. If you go in the other direction and you look, for example, in, on your iPhone on this virtual keyboard, you know that oftentimes the errors are the, uh, the, um, the, the um, character besides the character that you tried to press, right? So there's some systematic problem. Or if you look to OCR, and you have um, the word linked in this bitmap that you're trying to recognize, you wouldn't be surprised if it would be recognized as, as a, uh, the second letter as a lowercase l, as an uppercase i, or as a one. They look kind of the same, right? So it's, it's clear there could be some deviations. On the other hand, if you had something like an x or a w in this case, uh, that would be a head scratcher, right? So you could, for example, then change your vocabulary to already uh, take into account uh, which kinds of problems you would expect to see. And when choosing this uh, tokenization uh, scheme, we can start at the very, very, uh, on this one end where you say I have whole, wor whole words and I see a specific um, sequence of uh, characters and then I do a lookup in my dictionary, like with this uh, typical approach that you have with a bag of words. The one problem with that is, of course, that if you have words like run and running, they may mean the same thing to you, but uh, if you use a different spelling, then you have fewer occasions that you can see from them, that you can learn from. So then you would use this stemming. But most of the time, with all the LLMs, we have something that is uh, related to, to subwords, where we would say some of the um, characters we see in, in words uh, will be repeated. There are high frequency repetitions, and so I make them their own token. Sometimes even that they have semantic meaning, but it's really about statistics, about the input. If I look at, the, at uh, somebody who is maybe working with uh, text input on SMS, then they probably have a lot of different vocabulary. They have a lot of abbreviations, uh, misspellings, etc. It could make sense to work character-based and uh, looking back at, uh, back at uh, this morning with, with uh, uh, Augustine, with the uh, 20, 21 um, characters based uh, dictionary, right? That uh, probably wouldn't make much sense in these other senses uh, as well, but uh, you could do it here. Now, all of those, those look back at the uh, input data. They do not care about the task at hand, which is something that usually we would like to do when we do uh, some kind of uh, machine learning as we would like to have this end-to-end -end process. And very few models do, um, but depending on your task, this could be an interesting uh, proposition as well. So the PALM model has 256,000 um, dictionary entries. Do you, do you know why this is? Can you just repeat the question? The PALM model? It has a dictionary of uh, 256,000 entries. Uh, that's how many words there are in English? No, the, I, I suppose there are fewer, but I'm not quite sure. And um, it's, it's based on subwords. So it would be also, it's bre breaking it down, right? So if you have, ideally you have something like, uh, say, it is as a word that uh, ends, as a part of, of, as a suffix of a word, and you would say, okay, it means inflammation, right? And it come, you see this over and over again, but you can transfer this to others, and it's easy to relearn other words when you have the parts already, even if you've never seen them before. Maybe a lot of engrams from different languages and different Unicode uh, codes, different terminologies, and so on. That would work if you have a lot of variety uh, in the inputs, that's uh, certainly helpful if you have enough data. But this is specifically interesting for code. So, I, um, so if you, for example, A, uh, want to say that um, four white space and eight white space and 12 white space and certain user white space, if they have semantic meaning, then it's uh, easier to, if you have this uh, large uh, vocabulary. 
but also you're not throwing away information. It's uh, this, this palm thing is reversible, right? You, you can uh, read code, but you, then you want to generate code. And if you have a, a scheme where you're reducing basically the, the information that you, that you got into the semantics, then you may lose the representation. But if you create the code again with a code generator, then you would need to apply this again. And in general, on the left side, you have very few uh, tokens, but they're all very meaningful. And to the right, uh, you have um, uh, the, the opposite. But this then also led, leads us to uh, how big the vocabulary needs to be. And you can tune this for your own task then. And um, if you see Bird with, uh, it has like 30,000 and uh, GPT something has then like 50,000 or what we just had 256,000. For a simple, uh, simple task like, like the Stack Overflow thing, uh, it was enough to have like a thousand or so to make serious progress. And then you see it's, it's kind of leveling off uh, at uh, 4,000. And you can then check this for yourself for your specific student. The teacher would still have the original uh, encoding that was um, used in the pre-training. OK. so. We talked about a little bit about uh, input size before, and um, the question is not always the case, how large is my input, but um, how long do I need to read it to get something meaningful from it? If you go back to the news article, we would expect there's a title. And if, you just, uh, if your task is only to say if it's sport or business, then maybe the first 16 tokens are sufficient always. If you have something that's a little bit more complicated uh, as a task, you may want to take the abstract as well. And then you start with the actual text, of course. You can go uh, and knock yourself out to the end, but then you would have a, a really complicated task that need to understand the whole, uh, the whole text to, to do a classification. But if you, for example, want to generate something or you want to summarize, then of course you need to be able to read all of it. Right? And in our case, can you please just look at the right side for the moment? Um, we checked this for the Stack Overflow set, and it made absolutely no difference if you used uh, 32 token or 128 tokens, because in a Stack Overflow post, you start with saying what your problem is, and then you're getting more detailed. You're not uh, usually ending and saying, oh, what I also want to say, I have some, some uh, totally different problem, right? And so understanding that, you also then know what I, could be a good architecture for you to use if you have short or long um, inputs. This is um, when we use knowledge distillation, where we also have the pseudo-labeling. When we look on the other side, this is when we train the models from scratch. And these are the same models, except we see here with the LSTM that the performance gets uh, worse over time, uh, not over time, uh, with more long longer inputs. And we can see uh, that this can happen with an LSTM, right? If you have to have to backpropagate over 128 steps, that's like, like a 128 layers. So it's kind of hard, but kind of hard oftentimes means in training then uh, if you have enough data, it, it gets easier. And so because we now have 55,000 examples instead of 5,000, we can bring more stability to the learning process. Now we had the tokens and now we would uh, do the lookup for the um, embeddings. But alternatively, we, we also have this just the bag of words approach, as I mentioned before. We would see that there are uh, certain words that are signals to us that we can use, but uh, these are all distinct and discrete words that we would have to learn separately. If we, on the other hand, map those, um, those identities to embeddings and then we learn like 500 uh, dimensions for, uh, for each of these uh, entities, then we can say, okay, they're used in the same context, so we expect that they are, have very similar uh, dimensions and then we know what, what the distance is. And so when we know that some words are similar, then we can also learn representations, we can learn rules, hierarchical rules, that we can just have to learn one time for a certain situation and we don't have to relearn it over and over again. At the end of the day, it would be possible with a bag of words to also learn most of the things, uh, but it would be more effort because if you have uh, like the classifier that wants to um, wants to understand if something is sports, right? And it, um, there are probably five different words for, for ball. And those five different words would also be their own token. And you would need to learn rules that are always the, uh, the same for these five different words. And hopefully, you have enough training data for the different representations of uh, the word. 
But if you have the embeddings, that's not a problem because they all come back to this one uh, entity that is very close uh, to the others. Are we doing okay? Do you have questions? Okay, thanks. So especially when we have uh, the transformer and you implement this from scratch, it doesn't know anything about position. We have to add this on top. But now that we know that we have to add this on top, the question is also, do we need it? But many of the classifications don't need this at all. And so then you also don't need to use that feature or the transformer architecture. Um, this is an example. If you say the service was bad or we say the service was not bad, it doesn't really matter for most tasks, right? Because even if not, we don't understand the, the position, uh, we know that not will be negating and bad is what we're looking for. So it would be okay just to see which words uh, would be in a sentence. But in the example below, we would see that we say it's one part of the sentence says it was not far, and then a separate part of the sentence says, but the service was bad. So we need to know that bad is referring to the service and that this not is not a negation for the bad. And many tasks need that, many are, some others don't, right? And so when we uh, look at the transformer blocks uh, that give us a, the opportunity to, in each of the layers, uh, you know, we, we looked at the architecture of the transformer blocks, we may, we may have 12, 24, 100, and each time we get the op opportunity to um, distribute information and then recompute on all these positions and this uh, redistribution basically means that I can, with the not, for example, can find not and bad, and that I want to bring them together um, to the, the not to the bad, for example. And then I can do this on all the layers above. And some cases, this is uh, really uh, helpful. In particular, we, we, um, in self-attention, we have this contextualization of the new uh, tokens that we create for the layer uh, buffers, where we can use information of everything around us uh, to learn from this. And we oftentimes use it for disambiguation or for this uh, polysemy, where we say there's a word that in the lexical space is, uh, is called bank, but it could mean that there's a bank that you can sit on or the bank that you put money on or that it's a, a river bank or that you bank a plane, etc. They're all spelled the same way, but depending on the other words that I, I can include in my, my self-attention, I can figure out that there's a specific meaning meant, and so I can then change the bank word so that in the layers above, they become a representation that is then specific to the money version of the bank. This is uh, helpful for, for many tasks, but of course, especially with simple classification, you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't need that, so you wouldn't need the transformer blocks then. Depends on the case again. One thing that you will always need this is, uh, I would say, uh, is core references. When you, for example, say, the room was good, but the service was bad. Right? That is one uh, example where we want to say good refers to room and bad to service. Or here we use it. We got a room assigned and it was horrible though. So we need to know that it is referring to what? To though or horrible or room. And that's also something that we can learn by including the transformer blocks for us. And on the very top, uh, we talked about that we have these different transform blocks. They, they create those representations, and at some point, we need to map it to the class that we have, like these three different uh, news article types or this uh, seven different labels we have for um, our uh, Stack Overflow classifier. And so one problem uh, that we uh, have, we, we have the 768, that, that would be the dimensions of, of, the, of, the, of a token. Uh, of, of, the, of one position uh, to seven, but we originally had a, a full sentence with like 15 words in one case and 25 in another case, so it was variable lengths. But the actual mapping that we would do, uh, it has to be fixed lengths, right? Otherwise, the, the hat doesn't work uh, on, the, on top of the transformer, this uh, MLP on top. So one way to do this is that we would just average uh, over all the, the, um, the representation, the positions that we have at the very top, or that we just select one of the tokens that is the only one that's allowed to transfer knowledge, 
uh, into the classifying head and then the, the network in the uh, transformable box is learning uh, that it needs to route the information uh, to that, uh, again, using self-attention. Some places we would also say that we want to add some, um, that we, we, we start with our own implementation so we can also reconsider uh, some of the design choices of the pre-trained uh, model if you want to use them or not. And so one, of, uh, one I want to show you, uh, in BERT you have, uh, on top of here you have a pooler. So before you have this uh, linear classifier, you also have a uh, mapping uh, 768 to 768 where you also have a nonlinearity in between. I'll show you the code in a second. I'll, I'll show you the code now. Um, there are two ways that we, that we look at what, what the impact is. One is uh, that we say we only have a, um, the linear layer on this uh, very top where we go from 768 to 7. So that is rather simple. Or we have this pooling mechanism where we say we go from 768 to some other number, let's say in this case 768 again. Uh, then we have the, uh, the activation function, and then we have another 768 to 7. So I hope it's clear that we would have more capacity over here uh, than over there. So then what would conventional wisdom tell us? Uh, I will ask you to, if you think that this version should have a better performance or that version had a be has a better performance, and the data set is, um, I think, MDB... Um, uh, review sentiments, so it's something like that. And so this has, um, who thinks that this should have a better performance? Okay. Who think, thinks that this should have a better performance? So it's 50-50, okay. I think it's clear that conventional wisdom would say if you have more capacity, it should have the same performance or better. But trying it out, it's, this is not the case. So we, we can see here um, this is with one layer. Just look at this, the transformer with just one layer. And we see over here, sorry, um, if we just have the linear layer, this is the performance we see. It's 0.78.3. And if we have this extra capacity, the performance drops. And now looking at uh, four layers, we see the same picture. It's even more pronounced. Between four and eight, we don't see much of a difference anymore. But this is strange. And if you have uh, ideas why this is, or alternative ideas to what I will tell you now, to, uh, please tell me tonight. Um, but uh, my, my thinking here is that uh, we, we can define in which places we want to make it hard or easy for a model to learn. And if you add this nonlinearity and this extra capacity directly to the head, this is also where we create the error then it's relatively easy to adapt it there um, to uh, improve the loss. But if you say it's, it's kind of hard because we have a linear layer, you want to? Okay. Because we have this linear layer only, then it needs to push down to the transform blocks, which are in general more potent, um, but uh, you, you need to go m many more steps uh, in the backpropagation process. And you can, of course, look at uh, different constellations that, that you want to do, but because uh, you're not just fine-tuning, because you're building something from scratch with maybe also fewer layers, uh, you can redesign all these architectural decisions. Um, what is the average length of each uh, row of the data set? And yeah. is it skewed on the, uh, on the left side? So uh, are there a lot of uh, videos with less than 50 words? I can't answer that. So the question was about the data set, uh, how much it's, it is skewed, and if there are some with just 50 words. Uh, I can't say. But we can look it up later. But, but what, what would be the answer then, if it were skewed? You mean skewed to, to short answers, right? Yeah? It's too short, and then uh, you're trying to like, uh, have a, like, you're complicating and fitting it into like 600 uh, embeddings. Well, the number of embeddings is more related to uh, the number of words in a dictionary, not so much of the length of the input. And in general, the length of the input is not making it to the top because uh, we have this, this um, place where we go from this variable size input 
using the CLS token to the classifying head or using the averaging. But happy, but happy to continue this uh, discussion tonight. From my experience, when you are uh, uh, fine-tuning the head, uh, you are usually using, um, you are usually freezing the uh, layers below, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are adding uh, one or another top layer, uh, using one or another, or linear is the linear or the more dense, uh, the more potent layer, group of layers, uh, is it uh, really important uh, to freeze uh, uh, the layers, uh, or does it? Uh, let me rephrase it, please. Um, uh, depending on how many layers have you frozen, uh, does it really uh, important, important that much that you have more potent layers on the head? Because if you leave more uh, layers, but, but but in this case, not no layers have been frozen. Uh, this is just a uh, one-layer transformer yeah. encoder, so the embeddings weren't frozen, and also not the transformer layer. The, this one single transformer block wasn't frozen here. Okay. I just used one and four to show if I have more capacity in the transformer blocks, then the performance goes up. If I use a linear uh, classifying head at the top. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. Alex? Yeah, I'm curious, uh, maybe uh, the larger head just uh, overfits, like, uh, or, uh, or is uh, the loss during training also better in case of the smaller head? Uh, I don't remember, sorry, yeah. but, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll keep it much, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good idea, yeah. yeah. Mariana, what's the size of the date? Of the of the thing that you're uh, tuning on on this on this particular experiment, uh, I think it's a transformer with 768 dimensions. Uh, one uh, data set. I don't know, like the MDB. Uh, maybe somebody can quickly Google. It's like a few thousand uh, uh, inputs. So it's not like fifty thousand. Can that be the, the reason? I mean, if you if you go much larger, maybe this this disappears. If I go much larger, maybe this disappears. So that would be then the same about um, if, if it's uh, overfitting, yeah. It, that, could, that could be a reason as well, yeah. I'll have to check this out. So I want to quickly tell you how to put this thing together and we can go into detail if you're interested, but right now I just want to give you this uh, quick overview with what, what the steps for this are. So we start by saying that we want to train the teacher and of course, one of the inputs uh, is the original uh, labels. That's our X and Y. And we are creating this teacher model as an output. And then we use that teacher model as an input to this new process to create our pseudo-labeled data, plus uh, taking the extra data that was the X2 into account. And then we are creating, um, we, we already have Y, right? And now here we're creating uh, Y prime and Y2 prime. And with that, we can then, uh, sorry, I have to look at this myself. Okay. Then we come to the training of the student and the student takes all the data. So the hard labels as well as the soft labels and it's creating the student model. And after we have created that, we would do the evaluation. And as I mentioned, we just do the evaluation on the hard labels and their training data, uh, so validation data, and we have the student model. It's a pretty, uh, simple uh, process. It, uh, there's a few more too much, too many boxes here to to see this uh, clearly, but it's it's really just just where it's just really three uh, steps, and then you can use uh, the model. So it's 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 relatively easy to uh, implement, uh, I would say. Questions so far? Please. If you are using the uh, hard label data and soft label data, is it uh, any chance that the student model can learn from the data that this particular example is taken from the, the first data set with the hard labels and this is the, the one that has been produced by the teacher model and make advantage of this? 
So the question was, uh, just to repeat, um, if the uh, Chinese pro yeah? If, if my understanding is correct, uh, the hard label data has uh, one fault encoding, right? Yeah. And the soft uh, uh, label data has more uh, 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 dispersed uh, probabilities. Uh, can the student model uh, learn uh, that, learn the, uh, the source of the data because uh, the only one, uh, only one data set contains uh, one fault encoding and the other doesn't. So the, the, um, the training process really just cares about the, the X part, right, until we get to the loss. And I don't think that it could uh, recognize uh, from which data set something comes directly. But uh, uh, if we talk about the implementation, it's actually in the loop. We first go over the supplementary data of the, the soft labeled data. Um, then we uh, calculate the loss. And then we go over the uh, hard label data and calculate the loss. And we do it in this direction so that the hard label data come second or last because we believe that they represent the world better. And we just use the soft tables to, to, uh, to, um, to soften out uh, the model, right, and, and the loss surface. All right, in terms of performance comparison, I want to show you two, uh, I want to start uh, with two ends of a spectrum. And you probably already uh, uh, understood where I would start, but let's quickly come back to the task. It's text classification for stack overflow. Mm -hmm. And we have this problem that we, this is multi-label, multi-class. So we have this high ambiguity um, in the label set. It, high may be over exaggerate, but it's a significant ambiguity. And then we use um, word base, basically from scratch. But of course, I'm meaning fine tuning, not pre-trained from scratch. On one hand, and on the other hand, we have logistic regression that is distilled as a student from exactly the same uh, model from the uh, bird base. And so the teacher has 110 million, while the uh, logistic regression just has 30K, which is just uh, 3,500 times fewer parameters. And uh, we do everything as expected on bird side. We have subwords, we have 30K vocabulary, and we use the bird base 768 dimensions uh, for the embeddings. While on the other hand, for logistic regression, uh, we use the simplest possible tokenizer. We're not even doing stemming or something like this. And we have a vocabulary of 4K words. We do use a bag of words. And we, in both cases, we use 64 because you saw that it doesn't make much sense to use longer inputs. But if you had longer inputs, then uh, I think this one would uh, look better. But this is the general uh, uh, setup. And the result is, and it's a little bit uh, lemon-picked, uh, we have 0.73 with the... Uh, teacher as a, the performance for F1 and O.69 for the logistic regression, which is much smaller. So O.69, and if you had to train it from scratch, at least in that example, it was O.63, and that's kind of typical, the spread. It's, it's on the lower side. We sometimes also have O.1 as, as a spread difference. So it's, it's quite significant, I would say. And we tried them on the same uh, uh, CPUs to run them, and it was 120 million, uh, milliseconds with BERT and three milliseconds uh, with uh, the logistic regression. So these are two ends of the spectrum. I think there's nothing smaller you can do that's, uh, that would still be helpful. Um, and of course, in this direction, you can do whatever you like. There's, there's a lot more you can do. But for the task, it probably also wouldn't help. If you had a more complicated task, this would help. And this is also, by the way, the reason why I used the uh, MDB data set for this other uh, sample that I just uh, showed you, because for sentiment analysis, uh, you would know, need to understand what negation is, for example. You need transform blocks, and that's the reason why I didn't pick this data set. So let me quickly show you. So this is a report uh, that is created, and I, I, I appreciate that you can't read this. It, the details are not that really that important. It's just that we have different models here, always uh, logistic regression, and the distilled version. Then we have uh, the LSTM and so forth. I will go into more detail later. And we have this uh, F1 score uh, on the holdout uh, data set. And we have uh, the BERT performance as well as a human baseline with uh, solutions architect from ADOS who did, did this, um, this labeling as a comparison point. So let me zoom into, into here. That big enough in the, in the air? Yeah, OK. So this color, is, each color means uh, it's the same uh, model type, the same architecture. But this is from scratch. In this case, it was with a performance of 0.6, 6 
and then the performance after distillation was 0.7. And you see in each of the variants, this variant here is, uh, is a fully connected network with one hidden layer, then the CNN uh, LSTM transformer encoder. You see in each of these cases here, uh, the distilled version is uh, significantly better than the uh, from scratch version. We also better than human baseline, but this is also due to our data set that we have this extra regularization that apparently the algorithm is better in applying rules than, uh, than humans were. Um, and we can see especially with the LSTM uh, that it's, it's um, massively better because it's, uh, it has trouble uh, learning at all and has very high variance in this uh, in this performance, uh, depending on the on the training run, please. Uh, one question, maybe it's actually a down one, but since uh, the Peach network compared to its distilled version, the distilled version works better. What about having the teacher student as bird, but also the uh, teacher is bird, but student is bird as well, and you just distill based on hard labels, but the soft labels could it work better as well? Yeah, Arsen uh, was asking, um, what about if, if you take a potent uh, student as well? That's, that's certainly possible, and it's also giving a, a little bit better results. Uh, but the non-functional um, um, characteristics don't improve, right? So it, it would still be a really large model. Uh, but this is possible uh, as well. And even there, there's a, a, some good evidence that if you train from a smaller teacher to a larger teacher, that you can learn something from it if you have a little bit of... Uh, stochastic element in it, so you, you just, um, especially with this pseudo-labeling, um, this, this was helpful in this case as well. But I'm not totally sure about uh, any of this that I want to uh, this, this, uh, show, the, show the results here. But we have many cases uh, where distillation is used on itself. Um, we, we heard one reference this morning. I think there's a self-distillation paper uh, from, from uh, I think, um, coming her, uh, who uh, what's, it, what's this thing called? It's called Noisy Student, right? And they just use it for uh, computer vision and they introduce in each new self-distillation step, they introduce more randomness. More randomness. What, what it is, ran the randomness? They introduce more randomness. It's a paper a few years ago. I'm not quite sure what it, what it was. I think uh, they, uh, so it wasn't dropout. It was something else, I think. I can look it up for later. I don't remember. Okay, so looking at, I want to show you this as well. So there are four quadrants, uh, and I will zoom in, in in a minute. I will just uh, tell you what the quadrants are. This, the x-axis is always the size of the model in number of parameters. It's always the same, and all the, all the axes are basically the same, except uh, on this side, uh, we have the y-axis, or sorry, in this row, we have the y-axis showing the F1 score, the performance of the model, and here we show the latency. And on the left column, we have uh, training from scratch, and on the right, we do knowledge distillation. So when you zoom in, you would see what is to be uh, expected, sorry, with the number of parameters, the performance goes up. That is not too much of a surprise, I guess. But if you look over here, we, where we start with the performance, we can see that if you go to the distillation part, we start much higher and we end also uh, higher, which is, of course, a nice uh, result here. And if you look at the, sorry, on the um, latency side, then the main point is, of course, also that with uh, higher capacity that the performance goes down or that the latency goes up. But I think more important to see is if you, for example, uh, keep in mind the LSTM here, the performance. Uh, let me just go a little bit deeper. So you see its uh, latency is 3.6. And this whole picture here is reproduced on the right side mm -hmm. because on the non-functional side, we didn't change anything, right? It's uh, the exact same architecture. We just trained it for longer, or we trained it differently so that we were able to improve this numbers uh, a little bit. Um, Questions? If you're interested, I could also show you a little bit uh, about uh, the, the pipeline, but it's actually exactly what I showed you on the slide. It's just an implementation of this. So if you're interested, I will show you this, but it's... Um, okay. <laughs> 
Now let me walk you through this, uh, and I will make it uh, quick, but you can always stop me and, and ask me to make it longer. Is that the pipeline we're looking at? Yeah, let me just fix this a little bit. So the interesting bit about the pipeline is that it's, oh, you can't see anything, huh? Well, let me start here. Um, the pipeline is not forward driven, but, uh, but it's driven as dependency graph. So we have a crate report here, and the result of crate report you just saw, this is the, the visualization that I opened. But then it's dependent on nodes, and this node, for example, is called evaluate um, model LSTM. And then we have evaluate model distill LRBO, et cetera. So these are all the models, the evaluation, and they're all executed on a CPU. So it's also not the same process, uh, not the same machine as during the training so that we don't have a mixing up of GPUs and uh, CPUs. And um, as I said, you can see this. It's not important that you see the actual uh, writing, just that you see the structure. You see that those have a dependency on this graph a node here that is uh, preparing the label data, so preparing the training data. And those over here, they are dependent on create pseudo labels. Right? This is basically where we create the X2. And so to do that, we are also have a dependency on the creation of the fine-tuned bird base. And so this is the, the execution. It will be done automatically, the parallelization uh, and so forth. And if you were to look into this, you would then, for example, see that um, for the training here, well, let me just. Uh, sorry, Mariana, so, yeah. the, so the, the, the topmost step, the labeling step, is it, is it the date, the, like is it pre-processing? Yeah, it's pre-processing. And in this case, it's also uh, randomly splitting test and train. And just to make sure that on all the ones, so if you could do this during the training, but then you would have different splits in the different models that we are comparing. So in this step, we, we do this train test split once for this whole pipeline execution. And every model is, tra is trained on the same trust test train uh, split. But at this point, this is just the normal training data while um, uh, on the right over here, this creates pseudo labels. We have this prepared unlabeled data, which is also a split. Um, but this is the input for the creation of the pseudo labeled data together with using the, the BERT model as the teacher. And then you see, for example, the training of the transformer encoder for the still is also dependent not only on the uh, original data, but also on the pseudo labeled data. And when you look at one of them, let me just uh, click here. Sorry. Are the state maker processing steps or the transformation steps? This is, um, the training is a training step, but the evaluation is a processing step, yeah. So now I have this uh, distill uh, um, FCN bow, and for distill, uh, you just have to follow my, my, uh, my, what I'm showing you here. We have a train uh, and a valid, as well as supplementary. So this is input data config two, one, and zero. So we have three inputs, as you can see in the execution. While if you, if you were to zoom out and look at, uh, at for example, at, at the ordinary LSTM, sorry, at the ordinary LSTM, then we only have I think I need to zoom out to find for myself. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, here we are. Uh, so two channels, just train and valid, so we don't have the supplementary, so that we don't have the X2 uh, uh, data in here. So a good idea to, uh, for um, thinking about knowledge distillation is um, if you have enough um, data, but maybe not everything is labeled, and so you have plenty of data that you could use for the pseudo-labeling. That would be a good starting point. And then every time that you can leverage the approach that you only transfer the knowledge through labels, that is also, of course, really helpful if you have a disconnect between what the pre-trained model's architecture is and what you really need for your, for your application, then this is also a great starting point uh, to go for uh, knowledge distillation. 
I have a few more things if, if you're interested, depending on what questions you have. But uh, for now, I think this is everything that I wanted to uh, show you. And I want to say, I understand this was long. And uh, thanks for sticking it out with me. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, there, there are some papers I don't remember the name, but they they um, talk about a teaching assistant in between, so that you have multiple steps. That you they they claimed that um, you shouldn't go from a really large model to a really small model, but that you train a few uh, models in between. I don't remember the paper. It's it's a it's a little bit longer. I, I think they didn't have an ablation that w would be showing what would happen if you just uh, repeat the step with one student multiple times. But I, but I could absolutely see that this could be helpful. Yeah. Do you need the prediction of actually, or can you get away without just using the distribution for the uh, students? Uh, I didn't try that without, but um, because the the. Um, we would, we would be training on our own, we have, have a moving target basically. Huh? We would game the system if we were to forget about our original data. I think we need to keep it. Um, that was, it, it, it looked clear to me, so I never tried something else. Not 100% sure if that is true though, yeah. But for the validation, certainly we would have to stick to the original Y, yeah. In your presentation, you showed that uh, you have hard labels and then uh, system generates soft labels and we give them to a student to label. And uh, how to be ensured that this label is understandable and can be recognized? For example, it can be uh, uh, just a letter B and uh, the student can't decide what to do. No, so the, the labels would be the same for both. You would have the same labeling scheme for the student and the teacher. So one label could be, this is uh, uh, business news, this is uh, sports news, this is politics news. And then the student would have the same label as well. Ah, and, label yeah. and what we get when we say that soft labels is that we do not only get to say uh, this is politics, but we get to say politics 0.8 and sports 0.15 and, uh, and business 0.05. So that we do not just say this is the best uh, version we have, but uh, that we get the long tail, that we learn something from it. Oh, so uh, the students just turn, turn up the results, not uh, produce new labels. So the teacher is making a prediction on X, and the students making a prediction on X, and now we're comparing those two. Oh, yes. But we're not just comparing what is the winner in the results, but we're also comparing what 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 were the losers. You know, if if I if I if you remember the picture um, about the apple and the orange, we know exactly that an orange is not an apple, but we still would would maintain uh, that the orange should uh, score better, even if maybe just a little bit better than the zebra, because the zebra is so far away from the what we really want. So you mean like for next uh, token prediction? Yes. Yeah, I mean for next token prediction also you have a lot of input that is, that is uh, relevant, right? Uh, then you get like um, 30k um, um, properties from, uh, uh, sorry, uh, predictions from both models, and you would compare both, this 30,000, if you can. If, for example, your idea would be to use an API of a commercial provider and to do distillation on this, in general, this would work, and it, it worked in the past, but meanwhile, uh, they do not provide the logics anymore, maybe also to make it not too easy for somebody to use it. But you could just work with the, uh, with the labels itself. And also there is, um, let me just, Second. And the idea with the soft labels is that you ask the teacher for their view of the world, right? Instead of asking it, give me some of your implementation, you ask them, explain yourself. And now with uh, large language models, you can do this in a better way. You can say you have a user instruction, uh, use the given data to cal calculate the median, and then you say seven, three, eight, and so, and so forth, and then the number is seven as a result. But you could also ask the teacher model to then say, uh, I prepend some instructions saying, 
you are an AI assistant, user will give you a task. Your goal is to complete the task as faithfully as you can. Hopefully then, right, that we want to, uh, don't want you to hallucinate. But then we say, while performing the task, think step by step, justify each step. So instead of just getting the number seven as a result, you would then uh, get, this is step one, this is step two, this is step three, this is why we did those steps, and this is then the result. So you're expanding the knowledge that is necessary to answer the question so the student could learn more from the um, original teacher. Please. Um, if I'm interested in this solution, not from the point of view of, uh, of uh, inference speed, but just for accuracy increase, metrics increase, uh, can you comment more about having the, as you mentioned, having more potent uh, student than the teacher? Can it help, especially uh, in the context of the dark knowledge that the uh, teacher uh, model possesses? And, and the second question, uh, maybe I will give it uh, right away. When you were uh, scrolling the slides quickly, yeah. I just noticed the quantization and distillation, just connection and click something in it, but I forgot totally what was the connection or how they used to get Can you comment on that? Let me give a very quick answer to the second part, and you can ask again if you want to know more, but uh, quantization as well as pruning, are, um, you can use them together, right, uh, with knowledge distillation. They're orthogonal. So you can use knowledge distillation and you can use a quantized model, uh, and you can also start with pr pruning and rewinding. If you want to know more, I'm happy to, to take, take, take this again, but let me go back to your first question. I, I now have to remember what the first question was. Oh yeah, big models. So there's a, uh, a paper by, um, I think, uh, Lucas by he has, uh, it's called um, something like a good teacher is consistent and patient. And um, they apply knowledge distillation to uh, images uh, in general. And um, you know that they um, have, uh, that uh, image augmentation is, is super huge, is super important for this. And what they show is uh, that if you use image augmentation as well as mix-up, um, really aggressively, um, but in a consistent way between the student and the teacher, this gives very, very good results with large uh, models. So uh, mix-up basically means you, you, you take like 3% um, of one image and 97% of the other image, and you also mix up the, the labels, right? And it's still really helpful, but you can't go uh, really aggressive that you say like 50-50. Um, but if you do this on both sides, um, that's with, like with the soft labels, right? Then there's a lot to be learned from this, and this is and still helping in this specific setting. So this is it's helpful too. So and you then uh, also aggressively uh, create data that is not not per se in distribution, but helps to to emulate the the teacher. You're speaking about data augmentation. I'm speaking about data augmentation, but what I'm saying is in this paper, uh, they show data augmentation is a good idea um, for the student and teacher, but the coolest thing is if you align the data augmentation on the student and the teacher. So let's say the simplest form of a data augmentation would be that you do a crop, right? And uh, if in both cases you go in the crop to the left, mm -hmm. then you would see the same part of the image, right? And so even if the original, let's say, cat head is no longer in the, in the picture, it is neither for the student nor for the, uh, for the um, teacher. And so they can learn together very, very quickly, very, very, in a very good way. Okay. So your, uh, uh, what you're saying is that if the teacher, if the student is, is bigger model than, than the uh, teacher model, then you can actually using this uh, pipeline of distillation, it can actually increase the performance the metrics of the final. Yeah, and I would suggest to, to look up a paper that's called Noisy Student. They, they do it with, with the same size, I think, but they um, do this multiple times, yeah. And just going back to the quantization question, so I guess in, in that context, you can basically take the teacher model, quantize it, it drops the performance, and then use some distillation to bring the quantized model back to the original metrics or the uh, I would say they see this as orthogonal as well. So I, it's not totally clear that the performance would even drop if you use quantization, especially if it's uh, the teacher. 
But practice it always does. Yeah, in practice, it depends on how, how big the drop would be, right? And if you then retrain to recoup uh, some of the uh, of the losses, that's certainly possible. But it's not specific to the teacher uh, t uh, student teacher setting, I would say. Yes, uh, there are any approaches uh, of uh, selection of meta parameter which describes a fraction of uh, uh, these labels from the main uh, data set, a uh, fraction of labels from uh, soft labels or generated by teacher model, and a fraction of uh, teacher model labeling. Uh, which we can choose to train uh, a student model. I mean, we can use mostly the, um, the labels from our main data set, only we can use mostly the labels generated by teacher model. So are you asking uh, what is a good ratio between uh, hard and soft labels? I can't say specifically. I think um, it's clear that if you are, um, are able to capture more of the variance of the actual data set, Right, then uh, if, if there's a lot of uh, very special cases, then a much larger data set could be helpful so that you get to see them at all, some of the cases. Uh, for the case that we had here, I think um, we have like uh, 7,500 uh, hard labels for the training and uh, up to 25,000 uh, soft labeled ones. Uh, this was uh, making good progress and afterwards it, it didn't really matter. So 50,000, which I used here, is still good, but uh, it just takes longer at some point, yeah. And it, it levels off. And it's, of course, a little bit noisy, yeah. Uh, my question is, if my student model is good at doing, like, or it can do A to B, it can convert A to B and B to A. And then my teacher can only do the knowledge distillation from A to B, can I then, can I then be, like, optimistic that my student will improve in the backwards conversion or no? I think so, uh, because because it, it would it would still learn a to a to to do a to d b better, right? A to b better, yeah, but would it be better at b to a? But you also have labels for b to a, so then it's just a question: Do you forget what you learned of a to b? Uh, let, let me answer it in a different way. Maybe this is more helpful. It would, in general, be possible that you use um, very short texts for the student and long text for the teacher. Well, let, let's, let's go, go, even, let's let's go, even, let's go even further, sorry? I thought I was gonna say we can use the stack overflow example from before. Like the stack overflow example, we go from the text to those like classifiers, right? Yeah. And then we use the knowledge distillation for that. Yeah. And we improve our ability to classify that text. Yes. If I do that and then I say, okay, this model can actually also go from those classified like tags of those answers would I then improve my ability to generate like example questions or stack overflow posts, right, going the other direction? If you use basically the same backend, I think uh, it has seen more data and it has used a larger teacher, so it should be helpful. You know, in other cases where we, we would also freeze the, the backend off, let's say, in lit uh, from, if we do image capturing, right, then we would freeze the uh, original uh, text model. We just learn about the images, for example, or the other way around. So I, I, I don't see that, that it should lose any of the knowledge. And what you can also do, and I have a better example now, is uh, you can use multimodal uh, approaches. So you can have a, a text and an image, and the teacher will learn from the text and the image, and the student only gets the text. So it's kind of bli uh, flying blind. But it could be that some situations are Okay, a very, very small in, uh, in, the, uh, in the data set for, for the text, but the image is totally clear. And then the teacher will learn this and it can still push this down to the student. This could also create hallucinations in general, but I, I don't think so in this uh, specific case. So you can go from multimodal to unimodal. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much for your question. Uh, we can one, uh, take one more question if you want to ask one. Otherwise, I will give you a random bit of information if you don't ask one. <laughs> then I give you a random bit of information. I said mostly through labels when we do the transfer. There's also the approach that you could learn something from the actual implementation. If you look at the distal bird model, for example, they have a 12-layer bird model. They throw away every second layer for the student. And then they retrain or then they find, then they, sorry, then they continue to train the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, student and they recover most of the performance that you lost. But they also have a second term 
they not only have the distillation and the original uh, loss, but they also do an alignment between the, uh, um, the uh, representations in the uh, transformer blocks and the embeddings from uh, the student to the teacher. And there are ablation studies and they also show, I, I forgot the specific number, that they get a half a percent or a percent better when you do that. But we have to keep in mind that then we are tied to the actual implementation of the teacher, right? Which is, uh, it's also good, but it uh, has some of the benefits it doesn't have that I showed. Thanks again for, for listening.